So welcome to our latest episode of the Making Sense of Crypto and Web3 series. I'm joined today uh, by Sama Hassan. Hi there. Uh, Sama, just to give you a little background, is an activist, researcher and teacher and a faculty associate at Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And he's also an associate professor at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in Spain. And he focuses on decentralized collaboration specifically about how to build a free and open source privacy aware decentralized systems that may facilitate the sustainability of collaborative communities and social movements from the commons paradigm. And he was awarded the EU's largest individual research grant, an ELC grant of 1.5 million euros to work on blockchain based decentralized autonomous organizations. And you can find out more about that project at p2pmodels.eu. So really welcome, Samir, to, to the series. Uh, it's Thank great you. to have you here today. Um, as I just mentioned, maybe for new listeners, before we dive in, this, is, this series is really about diving into the massive phenomenon that has become Web3, where there are very bold claims made about its potential impact, claims that go far beyond traditional technology boosterism to claims for the radical transformation of our economic and social systems. And while there are also big claims, there's, there's also some equally big skepticism about such big claims. Is in fact, this topic is exceptionally controversial, perhaps one of the most controversial I've seen. And disagreement cuts across ideological lines. You know, there's people pro and anti on the left and the right. And in this series, what we're looking at is kind of digging deep and evaluating some of the claims and the, uh, you know, uh, underlying kind of thinking in this area. And we want to emphasize that throughout it, we're trying to like always give the benefit of the doubt and come from a perspective, we say of steel manning, trying to take any perspective and make the best version of it. And then maybe we critique it, but allowing it the benefit of the doubt in that way. So when you hear us put forward a point of view on this series, whether from the guest or from myself, it doesn't mean that we fully endorse it. So don't worry either way. It doesn't mean we're either crypto, anarch uh, you know, crypto anarchists or crypto libertarians or whatever phrase. We're trying to just understand this area as best we can. So, Sama, I wonder if we could start, and maybe you just tell me a little bit about your personal background and interest in this kind of area of decentralized technologies generally and collaborative organizing. You know, how did you come to this area? So I have been, well, my background is mixes computer science and social sciences, and I have been always, uh, well, uh, for a long time, an activist in grassroots activist and whatever. So seeing how, I mean, pushing forward horizontal uh, approaches towards organization or governance, I was quickly interested in, um, in power or how do we deal with power when we are dealing with platforms and technology. So the question of centralization versus decentralization came up quickly. And then, well, I got interested in decentralized technologies, decentralized ways of handling infrastructure in platforms in the web and uh, not just depending on a central overlord that controls the whole ecosystem. So after a few years within the Federation uh, umbrella, blockchain came up. So I was in the beginning mildly interested because Bitcoin was not really my thing. And yet with Ethereum, I mean, it, 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 it was more appealing, let's say. So, so to say, to, let's maybe just for the audience here, step back, because it's also a kind of, maybe at least a part both you and I went through, because I was also very interested in decentralized things uh, at the Open Knowledge Foundation in the 2000s. Um, and, and it sounds, you know, and, and people, and, you know, I, I remember, I'm kind of maybe old enough now to remember the first wave of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in the late 1990s, really, early 2000s. I have a, I ha proudly have an O'Reilly book from like 2001 with like these, this reader of P2P, <laughs> um, where the first kind of P2P systems, um, and even, of course, like IPFS, which is a big kind of darling of the modern Web3, sort of is basically based on papers written in the late 90s and early 2000s oh, on Cord and a bunch of other stuff that underpinned, you know, the early also um, 
peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system. So one question I have is that what, what, you know, we have some really amazing examples of decentralized setups or technology infrastructure. We have the internet, I think, and we have email. Um, the, you, you know, one of the things you were working at, but, you know, did you see successes or failures? I mean, they're these kind of classic successes, but in general, there's been, a, even before blockchain, you know, I was around late 2000s, early 2010s, and there's all this, the indie web, we want a more decentralized, we want alternatives, these platform monopolies like Facebook. There were a lot of efforts to build um, decentralized social networks, but they didn't really make it. Is, is that right? Yeah, it was, it was very frustrating, to be honest, because we, I mean, plenty of us put plenty of effort right in these decentralized protocols trying to use decentralized uh, platforms alternatives i mean there was freenet back in the day there was uh, xmpp or java Jabber, uh, that we would chat with each other not sharing the same uh, having accounts in different servers just like with email right even Gmail, when it came, uh, when it came to the landscape, they joined XMPP with the Google Chat, uh, compliant to the product. This was like a big victory for us because it's like now even the corporations have to engage with <laughs> with decentralized technologies. This is gonna be the future. Blah blah. Uh, diaspora came in as a, as yeah. an alternative to Facebook that was gonna be federated. And now it's just a graveyard, right? A landscape of, I mean, yeah, and dead so projects. And just for people here who maybe don't know, so if you're listening, what would XMPP was based around a chat protocol. So most people here are familiar with chat. You use what if you use WhatsApp, you use Facebook Messenger. Um, if you remember the days of Microsoft Messenger, or you use Slack at work, these are all chat systems. And what um, we're describing here was there was a protocol and it was an open protocol. So if you don't maybe realize, but WhatsApp is not open, you can't, you can't just create uh, your own WhatsApp server and allow people to join. WhatsApp is run by Facebook. They control who joins, they control how it works. They control you know, the ways to monetize or use the system or more importantly, build applications on top of it. If you wanna build on top of WhatsApp, you would need Facebook's permission if you wanna have use their APIs. And what we're saying here is there was an entire alternative called XMPP, an entire protocol that was open, uh, decentralized, because these, by the way, are often linked together, but the, the crucially, they and they often are, so open in a sense anyone could build on it, evolve it. Um, and as you're saying, even at one point, Gmail and Google were adopting XMPP, but basically it's, die, it's died out. And almost every chat system that's dominant or widely used is essentially running on a proprietary closed and centralized system um, which is which is terrible because it, it would be very, not that uh, yeah it doesn't make sense to to have a, a list of contacts in discord a list of contacts in slack a list of contacts in google chat a list of contacts in skype a list of, <laughs> but I, I in whatsapp in telegram we all have all these apps to chat with people and we cannot uh, how many chat applications do we need, right? Instead of having one protocol where regardless of where you are, have the uh, account, you can chat with other people, right? I mean, it wouldn't be that complicated, but it's, of course. So, so one of the things, and this is just, you know, Samara and I are going to be careful because we just get like commiserating. I mean, this for me, it's interesting because you emphasize decentralized here. I would emphasize open. To make a comment for the audience, just to define terms. So open means that the software and the specifications of a protocol are, are open source. It would also normally mean that the system as a whole would allow people to join. As long as they complied with the protocol and perhaps some other rules, they could add nodes to the system. So if you think of even a proprietary, your, your tele, you know, WhatsApp at Facebook, it's not running on one server. They will have many, many servers all over the world, um, whether you realize it, even though you don't see that. And in an open WhatsApp, someone, a, another company would be able to come along and run a WhatsApp server. Um, as, and, and connect into the broader network to be able to route messages around. 
they might need to comply with certain rules agreed by the kind of community, but they wouldn't. So, you know, but they would, there, there wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be up to one company to decide whether they could join or not. And just to be clear, open is therefore almost always a prerequisite for decentralized. Um, it doesn't strictly, it wouldn't have to be, but it normally is. But they are, di they are distinct in that you can have open systems that are centralized, um, but they often- Signal. Yeah. Signal is a good example. It's a chat application. Yes. It's too fully open source. Anyone can set up their own open source Signal server. And yet I can only chat with the people that share the same server. So in practice, we are all using the same- right. but that's, uh, so, so exactly, it's not federated. So that's not federated, it it's not decentralized. It, it is open and centralized. It's open and centralized, but it's a kind of limited, exactly. Now, just to say, and the thing in this episode, what it's gonna actually make sense is to give, maybe listeners will get it, but in this sense, we're gonna look at a deep thing between the economics background I, I also came from, I came from technology and economics and technology point, because it'd be kind of worth asking, why did all of these uh, alternatives fail? And why did email and internet make it? And just to also emphasize something uh, that Sam also mentioned is that in general, at least in the medium term, open and decentralized would mean a better experience for users. Um, it would actually mean like, you didn't have to have like five different applications with your contacts in different places. And more significantly, and this is me, the economist speaking here, there's quite a bit of uh, re kind of both theory and evidence to think that that would also lead to vastly more innovation and uh, economic wealth generation even um, than has happened. And the example of that, of course, is the internet, which was Oh, fully open and saw the greatest flourishing and speed of flourishing of like new businesses and enterprises in human history in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, sometimes today we're just so dazzled by the vastness of the monopolies in front of us that we confuse that with innovation. But most of them only came into existence during that period. So one of the great things about openness and decentralization is it allows for this incredible uh, innovation on top of it. Now, just to go back, why so why do you think there was this graveyard so after these few early victories why was it that that so little of that ended up being successful in in your view and i've got thoughts on this too but i'd love to hear what you what your why, why you think it it kind of didn't work out so well okay this is a very difficult question i will just give my take i don't have a perfect answer i don't think uh, I remember when Johai Benkler wrote The Wealth of the Networks, that it was a very hopeful um, yeah. point of view. We were seeing Wikipedia, OpenStreetMaps, we were seeing more and more platforms that were um, open, um, using the internet uh, to move forward, uh, nation federated alternatives. It was a very hopeful moment. And yet, personally, I see it like, okay, corporations got it. They understood what internet meant and how they could leverage on the network effects and stuff like that. And well, basically they um, shaped the colorative economy in a way where they could still retain value and yet leverage the, the internet without, without creating commons, without le, uh, giving up power, but keeping it, keeping it under control, using centralized infrastructure. So for me, the, there were three layers in which we, um, the, the more utopian approaches failed. It was, uh, for me, it was related with infrastructure governance and economic models. And we couldn't beat the, um, well, the Googles of the time and later on Facebooks and Amazon, etc. right? Uh, no. well, can, I, well, can I ask a question so just to come in here? Because I think there's such a really simple answer to this. I mean, it, I have to say, I sat there with Benkler 
and Lessig and others in two like the early 2000s. I mean, I remember sitting in Zurich, in sorry, in Geneva with them. I was always, I always thought that that I have to say the wealth of networks. I, I think Yaya Blake's amazing, um, but it was really I, I didn't have a lot of time for the book or the analysis about the the kind of Linux, you know, Cosis Penguin and peers based Commons production. I still don't, and and I just thought that like, to go into this is that there was this kind of naive hopefulness. But the reason was, I think there's a really simple analysis that explains a lot of what's happened for us. So let me run it past you and we, mm -hmm. you can see what you think, which is say, okay, um, network effects, you know, 89, I guess is the first paper. Um, but the basic idea, let's just explain for the audience is, imagine, um, I mean, the easiest thing is to think of um, two, two, um, two snowballs rolling next to each other down the mountain. And if gradually one gets a bit more snow, it moves faster, it picks up more snow, it will end up just taking over the other snowball. Well, the other, the other example is to say, I, um, you know, I, 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 I'm picking in, I put in an urn two colored balls, a red and a black one. And I pick at random a ball out of the urn. And if it's that color I put back, the same, another ball of the same color. Mm -hmm. And if I keep doing that, you can kind of see what will happen, which at the beginning, it's a bit random. I either pick a red or a black one, but gradually as one of them just randomly accumulates more red, the probability of me picking red is higher. I pick, I add another red. It just gets to a point where all there is is in, in the urn is red. Now that's, that's what we call network effects, which is there's a feedback or in a platform, there's a feedback between the number of existing users and the attraction. If there are more and more users, I want to use that platform. Mm -hmm. And that's true of obviously a phone network, of a chat system, but it's also true of many other things that are not so obviously networks, and which is why I prefer the term platform effects, which is a fish market. If in a city there are two fish markets, I as a buyer want to go to the fish market with more sellers. I want to go where there's more different mm -hmm. kinds of fish, where the there's more people selling a given kind of fish because there's more price choice and quality choice. And so I'll go there. And then if I'm a fish seller, I want to go where the buyers are. So even if in a city I start out with two fish markets, over time, one will get an edge. But even in other things that don't effectively directly involve like a network, like a phone network, we have this feedback effect. So what we see is that very small early advantages very rapidly accumulate into standard monopoly. It doesn't have to be monopoly. I would call it um, the law of one. There will end up being one fish market. There will end up being one phone network normally, or very few. There will end up being one operating system because an operating system actually looks like a fish market. There are applications and there are users and the, and the operating system is in the middle, etc. This is platform economics 101. Now, the question then is that who in that race, even though this fish market might be better over here, um, if this fish market has like more money for advertising, or maybe it's got more money to um, subsidize sellers to come there or to persuade buyers to come there. Think of Uber here, subsidizing their taxis, their right, you know, their riders or their uh, you know, ride offerers, you know, the drivers, that one will can win out. Now, in the case of email and internet, and, and just to be clear, the open marketplace might be better, or the marketplace that was different, but it, it's in this competition at the beginning, which is very, and it's going to only be one, there's going to be a law of one, there's only going to be one marketplace in the end, or one platform in the end. Now, in the case of email in that, for some incredibly fortunate reason, the US government basically funded their development 30, 40 years ago in the 60s, well in advance of commercial need. And so when the moment came along, there was already a, a fully established set of like open source protocols and system ready to go. Um, and even then, by the way, there were efforts, you know, like we don't remember it now, but AOL and some people tried to build walled gardens, but the law of one prevailed. It's extremely difficult. I mean, like the other example I always bring is Microsoft. Microsoft were the biggest, richest company in the world, and they couldn't take out Google's platform monopoly in search in the, in the 2000s. 
it is extremely difficult to take out a well entrenched um, platform, whether it's open or closed, by the way. And this is, comes to the point, which is a monopoly platform, sorry, a platform becomes a monopoly, i.e. controlled by one company if it's closed and it's owned. You know, and we have got famous open, like there aren't multiple internets. If you tried to create a different internet with different protocols, you would struggle even if it was better than today. Now, so I'm trying to say, in explaining the failure story of most decentralized protocols, and also if Yo I could go into Yohai Benkler and the naivety I felt about open source was, you've got feedback effects. You've got this incredible feedback effect and you've got this incredible race. Now, in a few situations, if you can either government fund upfront the effort um, that you're ahead or you can regulate it, you could just say, look, you, you we're gonna force anyone who, who's gonna provide chat systems to citizens of the United Kingdom that their system must be open or whatever, then you can ad address it. But otherwise, very simple economics, very simple logic dictates that you're mostly going to fail. Um, you may succeed later. What happens on those open sources over enough time, the monopolist becomes abusive enough and incompetent enough. And there are just so many, you know, there's such an opportunity gap and, and the, the alternative technology gets so cheap that like the kind of the, the, the kind of commons option can succeed somehow. It can get enough, it's got enough attractiveness in terms of, you know, innovation, other things that can see, but normally that takes a long, unfortunately a long time. Um, and so I just want to mention the analogy also with open source and Benkler, which is, you know, people looked at Wikipedia and were like, oh my God, Wikipedia is so amazing. And I looked at Wikipedia and said, wow, there's all of this government funded research and knowledge and PhD students, which are upfront funded by the government who are basically the source for Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia is basically a low-level curation effort on top of all of this existing knowledge, which is amazing. I don't deny Wikipedia is a wonderful resource, but it's kind of a thin layer on top of the research effort, the PhD students who curate Wikipedia for free in their spare time, basically, and so on, that's provided by governments or someone else. And so I guess what I'm just trying to ask this question is, does that fit in an explanation for you? Because it would provide a very simple reason why most of these options were gonna fail. And even XMPP, basically, it didn't have investment to market it, to make the user experience great. I mean, I, you know, I, I you know, to be clear here, I'm a Sitha, I was really angry at my work when we stopped using IRC and switched to like Slack. And I was like, <laughs> there's a perfectly good open alternative here. What are we doing? But the, you know, it was even there, the investment in the user experience or other things. So does that fit with you of an explanation of why decentralized open models struggle without, it, it, particularly in law of one markets, which are what platform markets are? Yes and no, that is. Yes, in the sense that that's uh, one of the most powerful forces. I mean, internet creates monopolies. The, 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 the internet that we have today tends to create it tends to create one place to go yes standards which, let's call it standards they become monopolies if they're proprietarily owned yeah we, we, i agree i agree i mean one standardized door to whatever service you want right um and yet we used to in those times we used to use a lot the browser wars of the time, right? Internet Explorer had a monopoly in practice with more than 90% of the share. And a new browser came to the arena with a new model, a model that overcame the old model. Ah, Mozilla and Firefox. Mozilla Firefox. And this model, which was open, it allowed extensions, it allowed customizations, it allowed things that the old model could not replicate in any way, because doesn't matter how many developers would Microsoft hire to ex extend Internet Explorer, it wouldn't be able to, to compete with the wonderful, explosive ecosystem that blew up around Firefox, right? Well, so well, Firefox... Well, well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't read that history that way. I okay. would read that history in a crucial other way, which is that Microsoft probably would have won the browser wars, but the 1995 antitrust 
case, which came to a conclusion at the late 90s and specifically dealt with their abusive behavior around Netscape, oh, meant okay. that they were constrained at the very point that uh, Mozilla was open sourced and became a Firefox became a competitor, which was important. But if Microsoft had not been shackled by the antitrust complaint, which prevented them then taking most of the actions. They were found guilty. They were placed under a whole bunch of constraint. Even if they hadn't been found guilty, the amount of um, uh, scrutiny they were under would have led them. It's like IBM, like IBM was basically, what was it? They fought a seven year antitrust case in the, in the 70s. There wouldn't have been Apple or the PC revolution without that antitrust case. It was government intervention. I agree. I agree that government intervention played a big role. I totally agree. And yet, with the government intervention alone, we wouldn't have had uh, a break in the. I mean, internet explorer would have continued, right? So. Yes, I don't know I what mean, would happen, but there would have been. I, we, yeah. we, but yeah, I got yeah. your point. That we need. We needed both. Exactly. There are always multiple factors. It's true that maybe if it came in a different moment, it wouldn't have failed, right? I mean, like other other. Just, just, just be clear. We need to play this through a little bit. The way that a platform, like, because the crucial thing that was a threat, again, for our listeners about a browser, was as most of you now know who are listening, you actually interact. You mostly, you, you use your browser for a lot of stuff. You write your documents maybe in your browser. You send email in your browser you kind of live in your browser a lot now. You know, maybe you do video calls in your browser. And what it, Microsoft saw in the 90s was that the replacement for their operating system platform, which was the mo one of the most successful monopolies of all time at that point, uh, and made them, still makes them huge amounts of money, was the browser. And they were very threatened. And they famously even wrote internal memos, which was part of the problem for the antitrust case, where they said this. They said, look, Netscape and its navigator is this huge threat to us. We've got to do something, which is take it out. And the question I, I have here is the way that you take out a competitor, like, of course, there can be open source competitors all the time. Why would it have not got traction? Is the way that you run as, it, like, when at that point, I think, Microsoft was getting close, like 80, 90% market share with Internet Explorer. They were really dominating. Is you start building proprietary extensions into your browser. You start building APIs into your browser that only you can control. That, and therefore, the open source options, they can do whatever they want, but your user is going to come along. They're going to want to use email. They're going to want to use document system. And it's going to use APIs that only your browser can, works with. And the open source browser won't. And people will go and use the open source browser and go, oh, it's broken. It doesn't work with my application I want. And they'll go back to your browser. And crucially, it's not the. It's easy to create open source options relatively often, even semi-functional ones. But normally, that's how you block them out. You know, there's a bunch of kind of, there's, there's this feedback effect. Sometimes it hasn't doesn't have to even be that you foot stop them having the APIs. It's just you can move at a speed and provide APIs that the other people can't do. I mean, sometimes you have to explicitly shut them off, right? Uh, which Microsoft also famously did around their operating system in all kinds of naughty ways. Um, but I just want to emphasize that that's that crucial government threat that meant Microsoft, who were doing that, by the way, they were adding proprietary extensions, were kind of blocked off from that route, and you still had the W3C, which was quite powerful about setting standards. But the, the reason we're going to this such depth, I think, Samo, and for the audience is, if you've got your question, and I think I want to remind our, all of ourselves, myself and the audience, and you, we want a more free and fair information economy. We want a more, I think, equal and participatory societies and technology uh, spheres. We live in a world at the moment dominating the technology side by these vast monopolies with inordinate amounts of power. And I think kind of worrying and unjust amounts of power over our lives, economically and socially, to the point where what you can find out, what you find out is controlled by what Google put in their search results or Facebook put in your newsfeed. This is patently an unsustainable, inefficient, um, anti-innovative, unjust uh, system we want a better one the, and therefore but diagnosing why those monopolies happen is quite crucial to finding a solution if we it's like if we're treating a patient and we we think that you know you've got gangrene in your leg and we cut it off but it turns out you actually had a heart condition 
that's not a good thing. <laughs> we want to treat the illness right. So let's keep going. So back to you, Samir, because I talked about that. What do you think is the, how, what's the, what's the cure for the disease? What's, what's, or what's the illness, first of all, and what's the cure? So if we continue with the metaphor, with the Firefox versus Internet Explorer, today we have Amazon, Facebook, Google as our Internet Explorers. And uh, we are seeing more and more government interventions, right? We are seeing GDPR. I mean, still they are soft. They are light. They are not breaking up the tech like Elizabeth Warren was promoting, but still they, we, we are seeing more cases against these monopolies. And at the same time, we are seeing people motivated with pushing forward alternatives. Alternatives, views, narratives, ecosystems, and tech that can be an alternative to this nightmarish scenario that we are today, right? We, this is when we were discussing the wealth of network, we were, I remember a quadrant in the, this quadrant, the dystopian quadrant was today. It <laughs> yes. was a few, a few corporations controlling most of our interactions in, a, uh, uh, and we are basically in the dystopian uh, future, right? So I think more and more we are, uh, as a society, but governments, um, users, but also even new new enterprises, are aware that this is kind of fucked up the scenario to live in. Uh, and I see that federate, federated alternatives did not manage to provide a new model like Firefox did, a new model strong enough to surpass the centralized monopolies. And maybe, only maybe, Web3 can. Web3 well, could be a model that is providing things that the current centralized monopolies cannot provide. Got you. I mean, and with the current, um, with the, um, right conditions with the right factors, maybe with a break up the tech law in the States or in the EU, maybe with uh, an, an GDPR version two that uh, forbids uh, data, tar I mean, at, at targeting or stuff like that. Maybe with the appropriate government interventions or maybe with other factors, new ecosystems can emerge that Amazon cannot compete with, that Facebook cannot compete with. So, is this the ecosystem that we want? I don't know. <laughs> that's because weird. Let, let's, let's even go on this one, because if policymakers are listening to this, I think this is crucial, because this is a story one could tell or, or not about Web3, and it goes back to this question of, is our diagnosis correct? Um, and just to go back, so my thesis was, hey, or the thesis I, that I'm suggesting is, hey, um, the law of one is quite natural in a, plat in a platform setups. So the question is not whether you're gonna get one, like I end up with just kind of like one internet or one email kind of protocol. It's whether it's an open or a closed one or a centralized or a decentralized one, if you like. And th there's this kind of feedback effect. And then, so th if that's kind of, just to kind of go back, then we say, okay, well, what, what, what does it take to win in that setup? Um, I mean, and there's a discussion, obviously, between when you've got an established monopoly and when you're at the beginning. So at the beginning, it's like, it's this kind of race. And what we agree is that open may be uh, more attractive, but classically, the problem with open decentralized solutions is they don't have any money. <laughs> or it's much harder to get money because you can't charge people in the same way. Um, or you can't advertise it to them in the same way. Um, so if that diagnosis is correct, you've basically a question, which is, you, you either need to provide more money early on somehow to an open um, decentralized model, or you need to handicap in some fundamental way the proprietary ones. You kind of got, it's or, that, or, or, or do both, right? And what we were saying in the Microsoft, uh, sorry, in the Internet Explorer was, I would say the fundamental thing was that there was handicapping. Um, I would also say something else. Firefox was not, there's another kind of thing that I think Benkler got 
and also Benkel himself, but it's often said about open source, which I think is mistaken, which is, oh, you know, the open source community somehow just magically creates stuff. I'm like, no, no, Netscape Navigator was funded by lots of VC money and they happened because they were being killed by Microsoft. They decided to open source the browser, but only because they were being killed. So there was this thing that had been like funded by VC money that was already really kind of polished that could be open sourced. Um, so I think that there's something here, which is to say, um, like, let's just come back to let's pick an example. We want an open Facebook today. And I hear this talked a lot about like platform socialism or, plat you know, platform cooperatives. And I, you know, I obviously wrote a book, you know, The Open Revolution. I I've got very specific detailed solution to this and none of them involve blockchain or Web3. And I I'm just going to, I want to try and understand this because this seems to me for, if you want to open Facebook today, you, 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 I mean, you've got a fundamental thing, which is, people are on Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram, you'd have to say that they're with interoperability. You'd have to say, okay, we are mandating that you have access to Facebook's full graph and API set. You know, Facebook, from tomorrow, you need to make it that any startup, maybe there's some rules so these are not anyone can go in and just spam all your friends, but anyone who's approved, and this will be approved not by you, Facebook, but by some independent body, basically has full API access, the same access that you internal developers at Facebook have to the full kind of like ability to get the contact book, send messages and so on. And of course, the next part of that, by the way, which is what you have in like, internet peer peering problems, which is who pays? There'll be some question of like, well, Facebook says, well, I'm running all this infrastructure. I'm running all these servers. You're now able to kind of connect. Um, you should pay some money. And that's a reasonable, there'll be some discussion about that of like, you know, it's probably quite cheap, frankly, but that same question happens on the internet where two people have networks and some, you know, one group have to pay the other group for like traffic that moves between those networks have to work out peering agreements and so on. But it just seems to me that there's like, there's no hope, whether it's blockchain, Web3 or any other tech solution that doesn't have access to the knowledge graph or doesn't have the luck, which is that there's some new area, like there was Snapchat, but there's some, everyone gets so bored of Facebook, that they want some alternative. But our history of networks is not good on that front. There are very, very few examples of that happening. I mean, even Snapchat, which has got high penetration among young people, you know, A, it's another monopoly to some extent, but it's like, it's not really, it's, it's like, it's very, they're very rare to come along. So I'm just trying to say, it's, it seems to me that, and what I'm trying to get at in that point is also, it requires political action, not technology innovation fundamentally. The, the technology is not complicated. It's about having API access to Facebook's contact book and ability to send messages and, you know, add things to people's newsfeed or whatever like that. But it's just like that Facebook aren't going to do that without a massive fight because that's their entire business model is based on proprietary control of that. Um, and that's a political action. And if all the people who are spending time in Web3, and I'm not criticizing, but if, if, if half the kind of even energy and resource that was going to Web3 was going into actual like just a simple political campaign to regulate Facebook in that way, it might win. But there's no, but it doesn't, but there's no money in it in a way. There's no, there's no way that I'm going to make, have diamond hands and make a lot of money somehow. Um, but it, that's my question to you is what is it? Do you think there's an alternative where we somehow just build it on Web3 and that like we will take over somehow? Okay, so first, um, I agree that we don't need. We don't need Web3. We can imagine easily alternative scenarios with no Web3 and still platform co-ops that use some other, other kinds of tech that, I mean, we live happily ever after with without a Facebook, but right, with appropriate laws and with appropriate ecosystems, we can easily write utopias about that. And yet there is no money there, right? As you were saying, there is no huge amount of money to make this possible. There are no wonderful laws that are uh, breaking up these monopolies or limiting them, making them obligatory open source or, or encrypted or whatever. That's, that's not happening today. What it is happening is that Web3 is attracting a shitload of money. Where, from where? 
from actually since the 80s we have seen the fi 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 uh, financialization of the economy right so more and more capital goes to finance and less to productive stuff which personally I find terrible but i mean it's the the, the the how the world has evolved capitalism has evolved laws has evolved have evolved in the direction and now a chunk of this insane amount of finance is going into web3 is it better there than in political campaigning probably not <laughs> i completely right. agree with that probably not is it better than in other kinds of speculation well maybe it is better maybe it's better than they that they are trying to build infrastructure giving it a shot on new inf kinds of experimenting in new kinds of infrastructure infrastructure rather than i don't know sinking can the, the currency of a global south country to make uh, more money uh, or or uh, or breaking up yet another corporation and selling it in pieces whatever or you know typical speculative patterns so Okay, and where is this Web3 money going? Basically, the idea here is that, as I see it, if they build a Web3 Airbnb, it's not that Airbnb is my favorite collaborative economy project, not at all. I would prefer more Wikipedias than Airbnbs, but, but let's take Airbnb because it fits right. Airbnb yeah. right now, build a monopoly having Locking, locking in their users, right? Because they have the listings of the houses, they have the reputation of each user, they have the user logins, of course. They so if even if there is a fair BNB or other small uh, alternatives, housing market uh, platforms or whatever, everyone like the fish market example goes to the one and only door for. Um, lodging whenever I go to a new place, accommodation and whatever that is collaborative. I do it with people instead of, of hotels. It, it, it used to be cheaper than hotels. Now it's not that cheap anymore, depending on the, uh, the city. Yeah. In a Web3 Airbnb, at least how it is, uh, how the narrative of DAOs tries to push yeah, yeah. forward, um, Different DAOs could provide different Airbnb services. Yes. It's much harder to look, do lock-in because you don't have control of the users because they, if they are selling the Ethereum blockchain, you, you, can, you, can, you cannot do locking of the users. You cannot do locking of the reputation. Typically, your service, I mean, most of the DAOs are relying on open source infrastructure. So if, if the DAO is competing on open source, even if one, one would be larger than the other, it would be much easier, the, the user mobility across services. And you can have more customized Airbnbs, like for example, one very much based on privacy, where, where it is anonymous, where you are accommodated or whatever. Other one, because of the peer-to-peer -peer nature of these things in, in, involve more risk, well, it, there is an insurance that is, has a deal with this DAO and you have, it's more expensive, but you have the guarantee that if your, the house fails to come by, you would have another one, you know what I mean? So you would have different others that have local culture uh, rules that are more adapted yeah. to, this, to, to the I, listings yeah. of that area. So, yeah, go on. No, no, I just want to, I get the idea. So let's just break this down a little bit because I think it's useful. Maybe even I share, I don't know if people if people are following the podcast, they won't they won't see it fully. But there's kind of two things that that um if 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 we're uh making uh uh if we're thinking about this that are going on in a classic platform monopoly, right? Um that that lot that that bring you uh, and I talk about this as a piece called Fixing Facebook that goes on about this quite a, quite a lot. But let's just summarize it. There's, there's, there's basically a part which is the, the software and I, I would call it and protocols. Um, so if we're thinking of one example and then there's what I would call the order book um, and associated information. 
So just, just to pick a, a classic example that might be, that, that might, let's pick Airbnb because we're talking about it. So in Airbnb, if I'm trying to build an alternative to Airbnb, um, what's the challenge I face today is what we're saying. Well, there's the software, like Airbnb has got a whole application, like a mobile application, a nice front end, and there's a booking system. Okay, fine. But even imagine I replicated that. Imagine I did had that myself. The issue is that Airbnb have the order book. They have, I, I use the term order book because it comes from stock exchanges, which is the other classic platform that we know of that like the, an old version of a, you know, of, of a platform is a stock exchange where there are buyers and sellers. And the, the core of the thing in the center is this database, like Airbnb have the booking database. They have all the history of bookings. They have all of the listings. And what I think just to say for our listeners and for myself is what you're saying is, okay, what um, open source helps with the software and protocols. You know, that, that's one thing, but then there's still the database. And the question is, how is that database kind of open in a way that, that works? Um, now, I'm just saying one way which doesn't require Web3 at all is just to have an open order book, you know? And in fact, that's one of the things, if we go and look at research and history of like market abuse, which is famously, stock exchanges famously have these problems, by the way. Um, I don't know if you know, like NASDAQ got fined a load of money in the 1990s because a bunch of the dealers got together and were like setting commission prices together and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can ask for things like a transparent order book. You know, you could just be saying on Airbnb, you could, you, you could just say, we want an open database. You don't require the blockchain to have an open database, right? I mean, I, I, that's why I don't get, why do you need a distributed ledger to have an open listing database? It's just open data. You could just say, here's this open append only, you know, database where you can edit your listing. Um, I just want to check something. Now there are certain pieces of information which are private. Um, which, which I understand. I mean, to take another example, like Uber, booking on Uber, you wouldn't necessarily want all ride, you don't wanna make the database of ride bookings open to everyone in the world to look at, it's like private information. So you'd need some rules about access to the order book, but that's true also on Airbnb. For the, for the order book information, the actual booking information, which gives me reputation, which gives me like what people booked before, like allows me to prevent them. You know, one of the things that makes a good user experience is that I can, you know, be shown properties I like, you know, there's, I'm sure there's stuff that Airbnb do to optimize their user experience. Um, that information is kind of semi, you know, private. Um, and so I, in the blockchain, I don't get like, either it is kind of basically public, maybe pseudonymized, but it's basically public, which is a problem for privacy. Or it's not, and if it's not public, then I still have all these problems of who controls and access it. And this is why, when I wrote my patent bit about fixing Facebook and about how to fix platforms like this in general several years ago, my question always about control of the order book and the, and the database is it doesn't really have a lot to do with technology. It's a regulatory question, which is to say, one is you could go out to those companies or any other company and say, your, your database, like you as Airbnb are have to declare, you know, if you're a, if you're a platform provider, you have to provide an open API or at least allow anyone who submits um, you know, their listing to you, that data should be made available to anyone else under an open API. You know, like if I'm listing my property on Airbnb, I should be able to put it on booking.com at the click of a button, you know, which is a kind of like, it, it's a bit like all this regulation about like number portability around mobile phones. I should be able to take my mobile number to a different provider with no transaction cost. I, and similarly, by the way, there's bank account portability coming in. You know, I could take my bank account number um, and so on and so forth. That, 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 I mean, you could put that on the blockchain, but it's not, that's not what makes it open. What makes it open is that someone makes it open. You know what I mean? You don't need a blockchain for that information, which can be public because it is public. You know, if you go on Airbnb, I can see your property for rent, you know, for anyone who goes there. And in the private information, well, that's a complicated matter. And there are ways to make that competitive. You can't make it open, but you can make it like anyone who's approved can have access to the order book. Um, and that's what like stock exchanges are supposed to have done. Stock exchanges developed elaborate rules to make sure that no one had too special access to the order book, because that gives you a lot of benefit. If you know what buy sell orders are there, you can do all kinds of naughty things. You can front run orders, you can take advantage of buy and sellers. So you have this important piece of core information 
that is kind of cooperative in the case of stock markets sort of cooperatively owned to some extent i mean there's still abuse that goes on and all kinds of questions but i just try to understand why the web3 part helps us in any way because it, it it's it's almost like people are confusing Web3 with being open, but that's just not true. You can have open databases in a GitHub repo, you know, in a Postgres database. You don't need Web3 for that. And if it's not that part and it's the private part, why does Web3 help me with that? So I think that um, you don't need blockchain to have an open ecosystem you can have an open ecosystem like with different kinds of Airbnbs and whatever, and by law being obligated to not locking the, their users and open the, the, the data that is public and open their listings and whatever. True, you can totally solve it with, uh, with law. And yet those laws are not coming forward. So is it a regular regulatory question? Yes, it can be a regular regulatory question. And precisely I have a paper with Primavera talking about blockchain as a regulatory technology. So blockchain enables us to deal with regulation in a more in a, in a technical way, more than uh, the technologies that we are, have. I mean, you know, the Lessig uh, code is law, right? So, yes. so, sorry, which, but yeah, which is, uh, um, you, you know, you, you know what I mean. I know it's, you. It's, 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 it's the, what, what the question, idea that. But how, just to ask you a question on this, how does it make the regulation easy? Because this is my question. What's crucial here when you say that about Web3 is how does it make making the open database easier? Is it because we're saying the next Airbnb will be built on the block on Web3. And because it's built on Web3, they will be forced to have an open database from the start, kind of by necessity. Is, is, that, is that the argument? The, idea, the, is argument, that, the yeah. idea is that if you, since code determines your actions, because codes embed, can embed the rules. Code, in the smart contract or whatever. I mean, since, since I mean, Facebook code is also political. It's also uh, uh, yeah. forcing certain rules for the apps yeah. that run on Facebook. Okay, but got if, it. If, if the apps that run on a blockchain will have to respect the rules of that blockchain. If it, so, in that sense, when you are designing the blockchain, you can decide the rules that this other, this other software will have to comply with. So you are forcing them to be open in the certain ways. You are forcing them to not be able to lock in their users. You are forcing interoperability on them. You are, you are, because code is law in that sense, you are using technology as a regulatory mechanism without having the law on your hand, basically. But wait, 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 just, just to check with that, Facebook already can do that yes. without blockchain. Anyone okay. could do that who has a anyone platform. can do that. Anyone that has a platform where platform third success. parties where third parties can implement apps. Android does that. Apple does that. iPhone right? does that. So, so what is it that, that then is about? Is it that simply we have a hope that the blockchain platform is going to be run by the good guys? Is that the story? It's, it's not necessarily like good guys, but on the open. But they'll be open. But, but, but they, I mean, right now, right now. Uh, the, the main blockchain, public blockchains that have succeeded, I mean, they are, in the, they are open source projects managed yeah. as an open source community, very similar to the Linux uh, or, or yeah. whatever, right? So they are in the open, they're more, more transparent, they are, they are subject to the same pressures that well-known open source communities are. Right. Yes. So, so because of because we trust open source more, we do trust these blockchains yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Than, uh, b b because of the openness of them, and then we have these open communities developing the rules that all these ecosystem of apps will have to comply with. Well, I mean, I don't love to give all the power to the geeks, and yet I prefer the geeks than the board of airbnb or of amazon or of facebook i mean so it's kind of like so the question is just it happens to be that it's like let's say ethereum to be concrete because ethereum 
like to run a smart contract, like to run your Solidity app on Ethereum, the code needs to be open source, essentially. I mean, not essentially, but most of it in practice is because, I mean, you can always go to that. It, it's very, there is very little cost to go to the alternative that is, that is transparent. Right. But that, that's often the case at the early, but, but what I'm just trying to say is what we're saying, let's break it. Early. You're on a platform and the people that happens to be that the platforms that have been successful in like web three, that people will sort of build on, um, are like encode these rules because the funny thing here is like we could have done that with like in a way um what, what i'm trying to get is that why confuse that with the distributed ledger technology what why why do you need that part Be because of the server because who owns the server has been always a governance problem for for the alternatives who owns the server has power right we, we have tried have we, we have physically but wait a moment, do we have that problem with TCIP? Because the fact that someone has to run servers is not been a problem for TCIP. Like yeah. For yeah, but for service it is. For services, we, we, we do these complex things of foundations and whatever to manage who controls the servers of, of, of the Wikipedia. Well, it's a matter of, I mean, then uh, we have to build a foundation and we have to make it democratic well, and we have to blah, blah, blah. But why is it that you're saying, is it just because services are more expensive than running TCP IP nodes? Because it's like TCP IP nodes are cheap? Or what, why was it Why was it that, I don't, I don't, it, I mean, for me, it's an economic point, just to make a comment again, people pay their internet bill. The internet bill goes to a network provider who's highly regulated in the UK, okay. and BT, and, you know, there's a, in most countries, there were whole fights in the 80s and 90s. Unfortunately, they're being reversed in some countries like the US, which is why they have very high internet bills. But basically, there were a load of rules about interconnection fees and how much they could charge that essentially forced them to charge close to cost. And so I'm just trying to understand, it doesn't seem to me that like running TCP IP nodes is that cheap or running internet backbone is that cheap. It's simply that, like, you're, but you're saying like in services, it's just we don't have a regulated infrastructure there. And so the idea is instead, the issue here is that we need an infrastructure where we can run apps. That was always the dream around the indie web was we needed an app. Totally. There was Sandstorm, there were all of these little things. That's these, true. That's true. Yeah, Sandstorm guys didn't make it. They sold out, I think, to Cloudflare and went to work for them. Oh, really? Oh, you know yes. yeah, he, uh, sadly, it was a great project. But the thing oh, is, the, the thing is, what you're saying is to run apps in a sandbox we don't have an infrastructure where everyone in, you know, everyone in the UK or Spain or America pays their 20 bucks or 30 bucks a month for the internet. If we had that, that would fund this app infrastructure, but we don't have that. So the blockchain model is like, there's been a successful blockchain, Ethereum, in which you can run apps basically. But just then this comes to the technical challenges, which is at one point that you said, like in this one is like, maybe it'll just get faster, but it's very slow and very inefficient to run apps. On that kind of infrastructure there's you know where's I, I guess my question again is so but but that is the dream i get it now so the idea is there'll be this kind of layer that like internet but will be kind of owned by everybody because they or everyone who owns ethereum tokens will have some say mm -hmm. go to proof of stake or something but anyone can write on this system it's permissionless um but then yeah and i just um i just always wonder in this question then so i just because several times people on this call You've said, oh, but, you know, regulation is just not working. And I agree with you. And that's basically a failure of democratic governance, which is totally. we are not, um, we're not electing, like and we, I mean, we, the people are not electing or not doing, you know, standing up, you know, like people who say Google and Facebook are so powerful. I'm always like, no, they're not. I, don't, I, I think if governments are way more powerful, you know, like in the history, when the US government went after Standard Oil, they were pretty effective. You know, Standard Oil was very powerful and had it was even easier to bribe politicians then than it is now or something. So I, but then there's this story of like, oh, but the blockchain will solve it. And I'm like, but wait, if the blockchain is actually successful, it's going to be, have governance at the scale of a state. It's going to have like that scale of participation. Why won't, why, if we can't get together right now to regulate these things in an almost easier way than building an entire new technology infrastructure, why is it going to be better on the blockchain? Why is, you know, governance is good now when there's few people, but isn't, aren't we going to have all the problems we have in a democratic system once we have Ethereum at the scale of our, our country? Probably. 
and yet it's an it reforming the state is much more difficult than doing a comic. Yeah, but I don't, but, but, I don't, I don't, like, I don't like, that, that confuses two things because wait, 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 that's a slay of hand that the tech geeks play. I'm a tech geek too. Wait a minute, like it, just right now, it's just as easy. It's just as easy theoretically for me to write something. I could just go to the legal office of my parliament, sneak in at night and write something. Why it's hard to do a commit is the merge process. Commits are cheap, even of our law. Sure, right. I can propose a new law. The merge is getting it, I, getting I agree, it approved is hard, and that's what starts getting complicated in software. But it's still, it's still, it's much easier. We don't have evidence. That's a big claim. That's but, a big. I claim. mean, today, for changing the Linux kernel, which is incredibly difficult, right? Yeah. It's, it's incredibly difficult. There are a lot of uh, checks and balances to do in order to manage to get a commit within the largest open source project in the history of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And the same, it's pretty difficult to, I live in Spain, to have, a, as a citizen, to have my, my words of mine in a law that passes the parliament, right? Yes. And yet, I think it would be easier in Linux. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute, but why? Let's just look at that. Because yeah, what, I, I, I can elaborate. What does this go? Because, I can elaborate. It, because wait, it's an engineering project with a benevolent dictator and a highly clear purpose in which, you know, in, a, in a state, one of the things we don't have, in general, everyone, so in a state, we have value differences. In a, in, a, in a Linux project, there are value differences. How important is this feature versus that feature? But there's a general agreement pretty big agreement and a very big culture of engineering that's behind evaluating commits. And we have a benevolent dictator for life, relatively. Which is hard. The state, anyway. we can also make changes very quickly with benevolent dictators, but that it, it's there's big reasons why when we come to govern things that look more state-like, i.e. the allocation of resources about like education versus the military or, you know, which immigrants we allow in or don't allow in or what, you know, like really mm -hmm. the questions that bring up a lot for people and a lot of tension. I, I, so I'm just checking, which is, is it because it's a code or is it because it's an engineering project with a very clear purpose? And I think it's a matter of governance. It's not about engineering or about being code. It's about, because regardless of code or law, I, I think it's governance and culture, totally. Right, right. But culture is maybe more important than the governance process. Sure, and yet, the culture today has changed a lot and our democratic institutions have not. Our democratic institutions have failed to adapt to the times for the last for few decades. I mean, since then, I mean, you know, millennials and Gen Z and whatever, we are still running institutions that are, well, they were built many, a lot of time ago, mm. and they are adapted to kind of a very old paradigm, and it's very, they are, they are being very difficult to change. Very, very difficult. They are very slow, and, and culturally, we basically have to wait 30 years for the people to die or to give in to the next generation to be in power and be able to implement the reforms and changes that, that we have to wait for the next, you know, the paradigm, the, the Kuhn's paradigm theory, whatever. We have to wait for the people to die to, because we humans are difficult to change the paradigm wh yes. while we are living, right? Yes. So public institutions are so slow, are desperately slow. I work, I work in a university that was founded in the 13th century. It's desperately slow. It still works like a middle-aged institution. It's so slow. That's why we build the startups to, to, to build new things and to innovate and whatever, right? I think uh, open source with the ability to fork yes. can innovate much faster than these old institutions. I don't, I wouldn't trust geeks with a lot, with all my politics. And yet I'm just comparing the two. Yes. I, in my ideal scenario, it would, I would give all the powers to the assemblies and to social movements, not to geeks in a, that can commit, right? I, I trust much more non-geeks, even though I am a geek myself. Yes. Uh, and yet it's true in, in these narratives, it is true that opens like in, in, in decentralized finance now, 
it was very nice, very interesting. I mean, I, 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 to be clear, I don't like decentralized finance because it's putting the, if it's putting the focus on a place that I personally don't think should be the focus. Anyway, but it was very interesting to see that open source projects of, of, of decentralized finance, they are being forked all the time and people are keep moving their, their assets from one project to the next, just because the next, the next fork makes it slightly better or gives or, or adapts to the rules in a way that it's better for the users and whatever, and they keep changing and they keep form, uh, forking and it's a very healthy ecosystem in that way. Because, bec okay, the, the, the incentives are very terrible because it's basically gain more money faster, okay, which is not, I mean, I guess but from I, the, 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 from the diverse. Is that there's this, there's this fluidity exactly. of innovation and, and, and of movement. And I, exactly. I, 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 I see that. So I'm kind of, um, yeah, I mean, we're almost, I, cause I'm also aware that we're at kind of a point quite soon we need to wrap. Cause there's a lot more to explore here. Maybe we'll even get to do another episode. Um, I, I mean, I just want to try and summarize and recreate it. So the kind of thesis is um, in the kind of Airbnb example, even if we went back to it, is that the future, if the blockchain is sort of successful, people have to run on the blockchain. And as a result, the, the kind of the, the, the underlying blockchain can encode rules in a way that the internet didn't. The internet you're saying could have had some rule like if you're going to run on top of TCP IP, you've got to be open source or something like that. I don't know what it was. So I'm trying to understand at the moment, what we're saying is that something like Ethereum encodes these rules that of, of what, what are the principles it's encoding at the moment? What, that you have to be open source? Or what are these positive rules? Because why like TCP IP, couldn't you end up running anything on top of it? Why, why does it actually encode anything in the way that TCP IP didn't enforce that Amazon or Google or Facebook were open or decent? How does Ethereum differ from that? Uh, yeah, sorry, that's why I'm not getting myself, I think. So, I mean, it's not, it's not just Ethereum. Any, yeah. any DAO platform today, Aragon or Colony or DAO Stack or whatever, they are trying to build ecosystems of DAOs with certain rules. So, what are the things? But our thesis was for this to work is there's going to be a dominant one, because there will be a dominant one. But there will be also somehow, dominant platforms for DAOs also. Yeah within the Ethereum ecosystem. Yes, I understand this. What, what I mean is that the rules of the, not, I mean, the blockchain and I will say print rules and there can be other rules. I got, I got that, but what are these rules that are gonna be better than what we have at TCP? So for example, in the, the idea that you can create new identities very easily in, in Ethereum, yes. you can, you can uh, create uh, identities that you can host yourself, or they can be hosted somewhere else. These identities can host, they, they can handle value in the form of tokens, uh, uh, tokens that can be like a cryptocurrency, but they don't need to. They can be okay. just well, giving you permission. Like, like, why does that make it like free or fairer? Because I can, I mean, I can hold money today and I can move it around between banks. I, I'm just trying to get, we were saying- Look, I am just saying, I am just saying that Ethereum establishes some basic rules that yeah. these apps have to comply with and they cannot they cannot just encapsulate their users ignoring this um okay they, they, let's say airbnb just it's, to go it's back. basically it's ma it's basically making the user the user registration the same one for all platforms without you being able to handle it in that centralized data database right. you've got your wallet and you can go anywhere so You're basically, you are you you are enforcing or oh, like uh, open of uh, OAuth. Remember, you yeah. are enforcing these kind of open protocols in all the network, and you cannot lock lock it in because then you are basically incompatible with the whole ecosystem. Okay, so wait a moment, but wait a moment. So just to check, so let's say we're building this new Airbnb. The difference is at the moment I log into Airbnb and like there's my identity as me Rufus or me Samir. And on the blockchain Airbnb, like the Web3 BNB, 
I, I have my, I log in with basically my wallet address or like, exactly. You know, so okay. you don't, you're not logging on the actual app. You are logging yeah. before that. So they don't control. Yeah, I got it. And then I give them my wallet address. Okay. I got that. Um, what, and, and, and the same, the same as that identity is apart from the app, your management of reputation, for example, is mm -hmm. also outside because it's basically token management. Your management of how much money you have, it's outside. Your management of if you have this uh, vote power, it's outside of the app. All these things, the, the fact that you have the certain permissions, it's outside because all this is tokenized. Wait, 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 but let's go back to Airbnb where our problem is that they're a platform monopoly. The fact that, uh, like, the fact that when you say my reputation management, like the issue with Airbnb is they've got all the listings. So how does yeah, they, not only the listings, they also have the reputation of each user. Right, but that's actually kind of minor, to be honest, compared to I think compared to the listings. Okay, even if it were important, what how does the Web three setup stop them having their database of listings? That's why I don't understand how the kind of typically the the. Okay, I don't really like the narrative, but this yeah. thing of trustless. Uh, we are creating trustless apps and whatever. Yes. I okay. think trustless is basically you are placing your trust in tech rather than in certain middlemen, uh, right? Was, yeah. So, so within the culture, they use IPFS rather than HTTP protocol for for uh, for when they are referring to data. Instead yes. of typically when you refer to an HTTP using HTTP. You are controlling that server. Yes. You, there is a server or an infrastructure owner that holds the server and therefore the data. When you're using IPFS, yeah. you are not referring to your server and you are not controlling your data. So if you are referring to data that your, your Solidity smart contract is using and you are using IPFS address like the whole ecosystem is doing, you are enabling that anyone can use the same data as you are. If you use listings that typically can be that could be public, you anyone can just copy your well, IP well, well, address. So that's the same as just making all open data. I get that. Yes. But, yes, but, but, it but is. I don't see that as sustainable. I don't, that's great. I mean, it's just like at the beginning of the internet boom, everyone was like, oh yeah, all my stuff's open, but soon it wasn't. I I mean, that I just don't get. It's like, it does, what you're saying, there's nothing that enforces that. There's just a cultural norm at the moment that people use IPFS it, pointers. The, yeah, Ethereum doesn't enforce you. That they, they do enforce the, 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 the users and the, the capabilities yeah, yeah. and whatever, but not the... Because I, 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 I could point to HTTP in my smart contract. I could totally. point anywhere I you want. You can. And yet, then people would automatically say, why are you using a fucking smart contract? Just put the code on your server. Yes. And we can, it, it doesn't make sense. If you want to do a serverless application, it, you do it serverless. If you want to do it centralized. So that, so that brings me a question I asked Juan Benet about IPFS, which is just the basic problem I had, which is imagine I post a picture of my home that I didn't want to post. How do I take it down? Yeah, that's complicated. Depends, depends though. But uh, it, the, 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 are, the ecosystem is evolving quickly and there are more and more ways to handle these issues. But well, yeah, it's complicated. Because the thing is, you can't have your cake and eat it. If I can't take down the revenge porn or I can't take down the picture of my house I didn't want to post, I also, I also, if I can do that, then I can also remove other data that I don't want to be around anymore. So okay. only I, I mean, I'm just trying to say is you kind of, it's difficult to have removal without control. In okay. a world in which- I completely I agree. I mean, the, you, you could use encrypt, uh, uh, um, encryption, you can use fingerprints, you can just give, give the owner of the thing the, 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 the capability of taking it down. But by default right now is you cannot take it down. But once you have an owner who can take it down, once you have an owner who can take it down, it's like copyright. I created my song, but I signed ownership rights, this record label, they now control it. Sure, that's true. In that model, it's like Airbnb, I'm sure in their fine print say that when I upload photos of my home, I give them permission to then use them, okay. but only them. I mean, I can in theory, take all the photos I uploaded to Airbnb and send them to booking.com, but it's a big pain. 
um, you know, and it's a pain to assemble that database. And okay. so I, I, I just, I'm just, Maybe it's you're saying, well, it will be public by default, so people will have cached it and then they can reuse it. I mean, but I just, I, the thing is, you see, the thing is, I feel it doesn't get around the governance problem that's really there, which is who controls the content and who particularly controls auto, ro, ro, automated access to it, which is like what's useful, right? What's in, in theory, I could go to every lister person who lists on Airbnb and ask for permission to get their content to put it on my own listing platform to compete with Airbnb. But it's such it's so hard that I don't do it. Oh, totally. And, and Airbnb will stop me scraping their site. I mean, I always love my first paper to go back many years in 2004 was about, you know, the early case like eBay suing people who were scraping their site to build alternative eBays. Um, and what basis did they have to do that? Because it wasn't, a they actually were using trespass law. The, the argument was people were trespassing on eBay server hmm. by using their resources, uh, not, not by actually taking anything because they didn't own the content, but by using their, their resources by making requests for web pages. Anyway, I just, I, I, so I, I struggle when we work through the story, I get I have identity, but you know, login, I mean, login's useful, I get that, but I'm, I mean, we, we have to probably wrap it at time for you. But I just think that this yeah, is a really, question. Really. I think working through this example of like, oh, okay. I mean, like, that's why I asked Juan at the beginning about IPFS. I'm like, great. I mean, I've seen these for years, but you've got a takedown problem. And that's, that's. I that's mean, the, the web has a takedown problem as well. I can copy it. Yes. Once it is available, I can copy it and replicate it countless times, right? I, I can, but A, I have two things. So, I, have, I have copyright enforcement, if in theory. Which you can also in the in the Web3, because yeah, but, we but, are not but, finishing but, copyright. Yeah, yeah but, how, but how do I actually get Happy. it taken down? So in this world, I can go, I can find the owner of, a, if, if someone's posted on another server, I can go to them and say, hey, it's on your server. Maybe it's not you. Maybe you're hosting it for someone else, but find out who that person is and have them take it down. In this world, I don't know whose server it's running on. You, you, you know that there are nodes and you can yeah. prosecute the nodes. And I mean, if, I mean, law will catch, we'll catch up, up eventually. Right? But, then what, but what I'm trying to say is in that world, why doesn't it not end up looking like today's world? Why does it, the fact that it's on Web3 make any difference to me? That's I think it's there. just, I mean, today, uh, startups attract capital to grow into Facebooks or Airbnbs and whatever. This is basically the, 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 the beginning to end uh, path that every startup today that tries to launch a web, web service has, right? Either being bought or become a new yes. big uh, whatever. If they're web start, start, startups, they have less power. They, at least in principle, would have less powers and would have to, to comply with rules that they have not control of, that would be like law, but it's because they are running on platforms, they are running on, on blockchains, they're running on things, and they, don't, they cannot unplug the servers, they cannot change things easily, they cannot lock in easily. It's just making more problematic the, the emergence of monopolies. I don't think, I don't think that uh, network effects will have no effect or stuff like that. No, no, Definitely no, will. No, but you're saying have that. Rules, but let's try, what I'm still just trying to pin down for myself is what are the principles they encode that are different? And one of them we were just trying to get to was somehow the data would automatically open. I think the claim in the background was almost on the block web three today, at least the conventional way to do it, which use IPFS, basically forces your content and data to be open. And, 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 that, and, and the question I asked was, oh, well, there's this issue of then privacy or something taken down. You're like, well, there'll be some way to evolve that. But what you, the, the background argument was, the way the major system has been set up is it forces content to be basically open. And that's, that's, that would then be a strong thing. Like if I love open content and data, then you're saying, oh, this entire platform content will have to be, and I'm just like, whoa, I just don't, while I see that for now, I don't see that being how it can be forever. Just so somehow there'll have to be a I way. I mean, that... I don't think that anyone can promise the forever thing. And if they no, do, no, but it's, it's, it's fucked up. Long is what but I'm but, but uh, I do see that today's technologies 
make it easier for the developer to build centralized apps. They don't need to, it's just easier. In Web3, you don't need to do it open, you don't need to do it super decentralized and, uh, and disintermediated yeah. and whatever, it's just easier. I, I understand. Well, so then all the tools, yeah. of all the paradigm, all the people pushing this forward, even fucking libertarians, ultra capitalists, or people that are only interested in the money, they are all pushing forward a vision in which it's just easier. Everything that the, all the frameworks, all the DAOs, all the tools, all the platforms, I'm making sure that the easier path, that the easiest path is to make it open, decentralized, disintermediated. Yes, but wait a minute, just to go back in this question. So we're going to, I keep trying to go back to the like, the, just the rigor of the analysis of the, like what's ill with the patient. Why do open source things not struggle today is, is because of the money. Now I get there's VC money now, but what I'm trying to say is it, if it continues to be open, and this could come to something we haven't come today, which is the FAT protocols thesis. And like, by the way, you can issue tokens that are bound to your platform. You can somehow keep your platform open yet monetize it. You know, there's, there's an argument that I understand that we could come to that we haven't covered. But in general, I'm just trying to stick with this to say, wait a moment, as, as for example, I have to make money in some way like right now, there's a lot of VC money, but the VC money is there because some, they might be like, okay, you're not monetizing now, don't worry. But at some point you're gonna monetize. As that happens, this stuff will go closed because what I'm not hearing at the moment is there was something that really enforces that openness. Fundamentally, there isn't something in Ethereum or the DAO structure that forces that. I, I get the, the, the potential. I mean, the, so, goes, the Solidity contract yeah. is, you have access to it. Yes. Which, which is great because you have the code. Yes. Uh, the data is, the, is not enforced, but the contract it is. Yes. You have access to the Solidity contract by yeah. default. The Solidity contract is quite simple, which is normally it's like the rules of your company or- Well, but- for that, It's not a full- but, I I mean, we, we can look at that, but just the, the point I'm trying to get I at, mean, to go back, I want an open knowledge ecosystem. I want an open data. I want an open information ecosystem where all software is open. My question has always been like, how do we pay for it? And the question that the way I went was like, okay, well, we need, we need to gather the money, the resources to pay for that, which require for the commons of information that requires the state because the state is the best solution we have to coordinate large sums of money being raised. Um, I mean, we haven't even got into block web three and public goods problems on this one. But I just want to say is like I'm I, I'm still not quite getting where there's the enforcement of the rules of these things that are being open. And if there were the question I'm asking, let's say if I said they were, I have this question. Well, then how will they make money? Which is what's crucial. That's the thing that stops open source software today. How do you make your money? Now, one answer might be the fat well, protocols the, argument, but the, the, how the, 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 the thing that in the beginning I was talking about infrastructure governance and economics. Yeah. Uh, about, uh, in the old initiatives like open street maps here we are experimenting with infrastructure governance and economics web3 is experimenting with decentralized infrastructure new models of governance and new modes of with tokenomics and whatever of getting money for your project with that doesn't pass uh, uh, that, that doesn't involve compromising the, priv the privacy of your users and doesn't involve centralizing your power and locking sure. them in so well, there might I, be. I've examined, like, those quite, I've examined those quite a bit, and that's why we got to be another question. So the question would be, what are these new? I mean, we, we are at timetable, so maybe for next. I time, really need to be new, new models of economics, but yeah. that's one that's crucial because if that isn't there, then that you're saying it wouldn't work. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Okay, so okay. I wanted to give you the last one. This has been absolutely such a joy for me. I hope the audience uh, this will have enjoyed it as much as we both have. Um, but I want to say, I just want to say thank you so, so much. It's been a real joy and a pleasure, this, this conversation. Um, is there anything you'd like to get to say, like, like maybe even, as I said, people could follow up on your work at p2pmodels.eu. Um, I love that your general, like, progressive commitment combined with this technology. And also, I think your, um, I want to acknowledge it, like, kind of the wisdom on the call or the kind of, you know, like, you're excited, but you're also like, okay, I'm not, uh, you know, it doesn't mean I'm like, oh, this is going to solve everything. And I'm, I'm also 
um, you know, I can be healthily skeptical. And I think even one thing we said in the pre-call that I just want to say now is you were like, look, if only people were funding like more money on facilitation, that would be even better. But there isn't big grants for that oh, versus really. blockchain at the oh, moment. Really. I think that's very wise. But I want to leave you with anything last you want to say about your project or people can follow up or just any last thoughts you have before we finish. I mean, if people are interested, they can always, I mean, follow us on Twitter, uh, me or the project, or just drop us a line if you think that there might be a nice collaboration going on. And uh, thanks a lot, Rufus. It was really fascinating. And maybe we can do a second version of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And tune in for the next episode.